But I'm going to begin, uh, Stephen, just by asking, I mean, obviously there's this whole kind of middle section of this movie has this great sense of ambiguity to it, where we don't really know what to believe or what to trust. I was wondering when you first got that screenplay, did you go through a similar experience as, as we did when you were kind of reading it, or sort of, not, I don't know, always wondering what's happening next? Well, I certainly felt like the longer you could keep this idea afloat that, that she may really have a problem, um, a psychological problem, that the, the more fun it would be for the audience. And in fact, in the, in the early part of the edit, um, I felt it was too explicit that she was telling the truth or that she was really having a, a psychological problem. And I, I showed it to a friend of mine and he said, you know, if you made just a couple of changes in these early scenes, you'd, you'd really wonder for a lot longer, like, what is her problem? Um, and so I agree with him. And I went and sort of made the, the beginning of the movie more ambiguous so that you would ask this question. Um, but I think part of the fun of movies like this um, is sort of wondering, like, where is this going? And how are they going to land this? Like, that's, for me, when I see a movie like this, the good versions of it, you, you, you just, you can't figure out, like, what are they going to do next? Um, and so for me, the heart of the movie ended up being, you know, the blue room. And it's always so great as well, having this kind of what you perceive to be an unreliable a protagonist in some ways, isn't it? That kind of like it sort of blurs our own vision and we sort of, because we sort of adopt her perspective in many ways. And when you right. can't trust the protagonist, it just makes for quite a, an intense ride. Well, I think if you can, yeah, if you can create this sense of, of you know, ambiguity f in terms of how the audience feels about the protagonist without alienating them. And what's great about Claire, obviously, is she just, she just pulls you in you know she's got that thing that you really should have if you're going to be an actor which is just watchability like you just want to watch her and i think those early scenes she does such a great job of of portraying someone who clearly has has decided for reasons that we're not sure of yet to kind of put a screen between herself and other people um, and so it's really, I think, a fun, fun, a fun process of seeing that kind of peeled away. Yeah. And I mean, you must be so thrilled to get Claire on board for this. I mean, she's a terrific actress. And there's something almost quite ineffably British about her. So when I sort of, uh, when I saw she was casting this, I, my first reaction was, oh, that's quite an interesting move. What was it about her that made you think she's, she's the perfect lead for this? Well, in a lot of ways, it was exactly the Britishness that you describe because I felt it would be really fun to watch Claire kind of destroy that. Um, and she seemed very interested in doing that as well. So to, to, to play this character that, that really, you know, is a complete teardown of, of, you know, the show that she'd been doing for two years, uh, that just seemed like, that seemed like fun. And of course, I mean, one of the big sort of talking points, I suppose, is the fact you shot this on an, on an iPhone. But that's not really the film, it's not the film's conceit, really, is it? I mean, was it just sort of logistical reasons for you? Was it just something, trying something new? I mean, what was the kind of, um, your reason initially for, for shooting it? It was, it was really a creative choice. Like, it wasn't a budgetary issue. It, well, I could have shot it on anything. Um, I felt like this movie would be well served by my ability to, to put a lens anywhere I wanted in a matter of seconds. That this kind of movie needed a kind of physicality that, that a small capture device uh, can provide. So it was, really, it was a legitimate, to my mind, a legitimate creative choice. And I look at the movie now and I don't think it'd be as good if I'd had to shoot it in a conventional way. There are things about it that, that I think are necessary in terms of the style of the film that are there because I was working with a camera that's that big. 
and also it kind of enhances that the almost voyeuristic nature yeah. of it as well, doesn't it? Because there's something, I guess with our iPhones, we're so used to sort of uh, filming and taking, um, taking pictures on nights out of our friends or on holidays that you, you use that, in, well, yeah, again, it sort of serves the kind of more thrilling horror aspects of it in some ways, doesn't it? Because I suppose it always feels like we're, we're, we're peering in when perhaps we shouldn't be peering right. in. Right. I think you're right. I think the familiarity of the aesthetic, even though I've manipulated the image to some extent to create, you know, texture and contrast, but I think that familiarity creates a, without people maybe even knowing it consciously, a kind of intimacy, you know, that again, works really well for that piece. Were there any sort of new challenges though? Was there any, I mean, obviously there were, there were loads of benefits, I'm sure from using an iPhone. Was there anything that you had to kind of overcome any stumbling blocks initially that you hadn't quite anticipated? On a technical level, the only issue really is, well, there are two maybe. Um, one is because the because the phone is so light, it is very very sensitive to vibration. So um, occasionally, literally to the point where uh, I had seen you know Claire slams the phone down. I told her like, you, you you can't slam the phone down like that. It's shaking. Like even though the camera was on this little tripod, like it was shaking the the camera. Um, the other thing is that. Currently, or at least when we were shooting the film, even though we were using sort of attached lenses to put on the phone, you, nobody's making extreme telephoto lenses for these cameras yet. So when I wanted to use like a 300 millimeter lens, I had to pull out a DSLR and shoot it with that. So other than that, you know, I was pretty happy. I guess you've always got to have, have it on airplane mode as well. You can't risk getting a text in a Yeah, shoot. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, no, we had to, you know, we pulled the SIM cards out of the phones. And because uh, I was reading, you said you may never go back to traditional cameras. But, if, but I mean, is that, I mean, it, I mean I'm not sure, I mean, perhaps one day you would, I'm sure you wouldn't rule it out. But right. I mean, is this, would you like to, to, to use iPhones again in the future? Is that the idea? Yeah, I'm planning to next week. Um, it's just, it would be hard for me to give up all the things that I feel like I got. You know, so I don't know. We'll see. This technology every six months changes, so we'll see. We'll see what kind of cameras are available like this summer. Do you think the sort of nature of, of the respective project could dictate whether you use an iPhone? For example, even though it serves this film, Unsane, perfectly well, I mean, do you reckon you could shoot an Oceans movie on an iPhone? Or is it a bit too grand and a bit too big? I suppose that you, you would you feel you would need a, a bigger setup. No, I think that's a. I think that's a sort of you know, ideological lens that I, I don't really share. So I think if I felt that was the way to go, then I would propose doing it. I, it's just, you know, I think for some people there's this hurdle of like, well, if you're spending all this money on the production, like, why would you use a camera that costs $700? but I, I just don't look at it that way. I was reading before, I think someone said this is uh, Steven Soderbergh's first horror movie. Would you define this as, as a horror? I mean, are you, and do, also does it frustrate you in, in kind of film that, 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 that need that we almost have to, to pigeonhole everything and categorize it as, as, as genre movies? Well, I mean, look, I think, it's, I think it's natural for an audience to want to know kind of what they're in for. The, the, the tricky part about a movie like Unsane is is making sure that their expectation the expectation that you create in their mind is accurate so that they don't come to the film and go oh i thought it was going to be more violent or i thought it was going to be bloodier or you know what i mean so we've tried as best we can in the materials to create the sense of of psychological horror as opposed to explicit violent horror i will say that i always viewed contagion as a horror movie. That was the way I looked at it. That was the aesthetic of it in my mind, the way it was scored. You know, I, I, I thought that was a horror film. And of course, I mean, at the core of this as well, there's this kind of conspiracy theory as well concerning the kind of health service, wanting insurance payouts and stuff. Is that based on, 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 on real life? Is, are they, are they, is, that, is that real life concerns? Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a quasi-legitimate scam. You know what I mean? It's not illegal but it's not entirely ethical. 
Um, but it happens all the time. Because, I mean, I mean, in some ways, I mean, this, and for example, say Logan Lucky as well, I mean, they can be quite, they're quite affectionate in their depiction of American culture, but also can be quite critical at the same time. I'm just wondering, what does it mean to be uh, an American today? I mean, is there a sense of, uh, is there a kind of um, a struggle for, for one's identity, I guess, in some ways, when it's a country at the moment that is, from the outside, it perceives to be going through something of a crisis. I mean, the president is quite a dangerous man at the moment and obviously this, the mass shootings aren't slowing down. I mean, what does it mean for, for Americans at, at the moment to be American? It feels like we're in the middle of a, a, a pretty significant transition in the sense that the, the, the foundational myths surrounding the country are sort of being challenged. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, um, but it's it can be kind of a scary thing to go through when you don't know where this is going to end up. Um, I look at what's happening politically as an opportunity, you know, for us to really analyze why we're in the situation we're in and why this country sometimes has a tendency to repeat the same mistakes over and over. And then there's this whole, you know, design flaw that existed from the beginning of the country, which was slavery, which then becomes sort of, you know, institutionalized racism, that this country's never really addressed in a way that makes you feel that it's gonna really change. So I find it terrifying but exciting right now to be a, an American and to be in the middle of this um, pretty seismic uh, sequence of events. So maybe perhaps it could feel as though we, sometimes you need to experience quite terrible things to be able to go, that's what, how did we fall into those yeah, trappings? Well, in to... the, you know, in the recovery world, they call it bottoming out. So sometimes you wonder like, well, maybe we need to, in order to, to evolve into another sort of state, maybe the country has to experience some form of like bottoming out for people to kind of wake up and and say, I think we need to change this and then do something about it. It does feel like at the moment, it does feel quite like a real significant period in history. And I mean, and also, I mean, in the film industry, I mean, of course, you, you sort of had a break of late. I mean, you sort of come back into the industry at quite a, a remarkable time, really. I mean, these movements, they feel permanent. Do you feel like with, with the Time's Up and the Me Too movements that these are changes and these are things that are going to change that are permanent? Do you think that there's, there's almost no going back from here on? Do you think that, that, that we're, we are progressing sort of finally and, and in, in, you know, because, if, if, yeah, is, is, is this an actual change? Oh, I think so. I think so. Um, I, I don't think, I don't see any scenario in which um, people can get away with the kind of behavior, you know, that led to the Me Too movement. I think that the equal pay for equal work issue is now part of every conversation that, that I have with uh, uh, agents and casting directors. So I do think this, we're, we're gonna see a secular change in these areas as opposed to just a cyclical change. I do think these, these are permanent uh, evolutions. Um, the question is, will it, will it, will it expand you know, uh, beyond these, these sort of specific cultural issues into a larger discussion about, you know, assholes <laughs> and I mean, have you across your career have you experienced it firsthand to, to a point where say you've been working on a project where you've 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 discovered perhaps even afterwards that that there was a huge disparity in wages between the, the actresses and, and the actors for example um i don't you know i got julia roberts 20 million dollars on aaron brockovich so i was present for uh what at the time was a pretty significant event in the in the history of women being paid to star in movies, and I was very happy to be a part of that. Um, I think it really, I think a lot of the responsibility, at the end of the day, everything is the director's fault, but I think a lot of the responsibility in in those situations falls on the producer. Like, when, what, what was, what was confusing to me about the story that was circulating regarding um, all that money can buy and this whole 
Mark Wahlberg, Michelle Williams reshoot thing is that obviously the producers knew and seemed to be okay with it. That's what, that's what was confusing to me. It's like, this wasn't a secret. You know what I mean? I don't know if Michelle knew, but you know, like certainly the producers knew. Like I, I would think somebody would have raised their hand if only to say, hey, you know, if this came out, it wouldn't look very good. And because I mean, about one film, you can almost guarantee that the women would be getting paid more. Obviously, is, is, is Ocean's Eight, of course. Um, I mean, what's it like? Because when you've directed the, um, well, not the, I mean, obviously it was a remake of the original, but when you've directed a sort of original movie and it has a kind of sequel further down the line, and you kind of have to watch it. I mean, is it quite difficult sometimes to almost let go and to let someone else tell your story? I mean, obviously the same happened with Magic Mike as well. I mean, obviously you're always still very much involved, right? But, but is it still quite difficult to, to, to sort of let let someone else? Take over the helm, I suppose. Not in this case, because Gary Ross had the idea. So I, I felt as a producer, you know, very happy to kind of be the facilitator and the consigliere, you know, to Gary. But it was like Gary's movie. And I thought he had a really smart idea. And this was a reason to sort of expand that universe. I think without, if, if the studio had come to me and said like, we're going to do another Oceans movie, like, and it's going to, and it's going to be female centric. I think my reaction to that would have been different. But the fact that it was a friend of mine, you know, coming to me going, what do you think of this? I said, I think that sounds great. I mean, do you feel quite refreshed after your break? I mean, it must be, was it quite nice having just a bit of time to yourself before kind of getting back into the swing of things? Do you feel like in that time you, I don't know, learn, learn more about yourself as a director perhaps? No. Um, the break turned out to be like two months, so it wasn't, it wasn't as extended. Quite long for you. <laughs> yeah, but I was trying to be busy with other stuff. Um, but, you know, every... I think any any director who's who's rational will tell you one of one of the good things about this job is each like you're really starting from scratch every time. You know, you may know a few things, you may have learned a few things, but at the end of the day when you start on the first day of shooting a new film, you're you're at square one and th all the knowledge in the world doesn't mean you're going to be able to solve a problem that day. So, you know, I like that. And of course, like, because you're teaming up with the Moonlight screenwriter for the next one, uh, Terrell Alvin McCraney, I mean, and, and Andre Holland as well. And that's in, um, uh, uh, yeah, is it Flying Bird? What's it? High Flying High Bird. High Flying Bird. Uh, is that going to be, that's an iPhone, is that the one you're doing next when you said earlier you're going to be doing an iPhone? Yeah. Ah, oh, cool. So what's that one all about then? It's about a sports agent who proposes a, a kind of restructuring of of uh, a sports league um, and the idea is considered threatening and so it's set over you know sort of Friday to a Monday where where he starts to put some things in motion and uh, external forces mobilize pretty quickly so it's really interesting piece and I mean you've had your sort of name attached to the Panama Papers movie for a while is that one still going ahead yeah What's I hope to do it this fall oh. Yeah, because I mean, it's been discussed obviously for quite a while, but does it feel even more pertinent now uh, being released in this kind of culture of fake news to, to delve into to a kind of more the, the virtues of journalism and, and to look, look back at a time when it, it felt like it had so much significance? Well, the good news is that Scott Burns, who wrote the screenplay, was able to execute my one demand, which was no journalists in the movie. So what Scott was able to do is for people who don't understand what the big deal is about the Panama Papers, you will see now what the effect of these kinds of activities are on regular people. That was what I said to Scott. I go, you need to come up with a way so that when people watch the movie, they go, I had no idea actually that that thing touches me. Um, so that's what's exciting about it is I think people will be stunned at how they actually are tied into this kind of behavior. Has, it got, has that one got a title yet? Is it still under, under wraps? Uh, not yet. No. So just 
Yeah. Because mm. just very quickly, finally, I mean, because obviously with Logan Lucky and then Unsane and High Flying Bird and this, the Panama Papers one, it seems you're pretty busy at the moment, or is this just quite natural for you? But do you like just moving from project to project and just make, maintain that momentum? Yeah, I, I like to have them overlap a little bit. I tend to work with a lot of the same people. So usually while we're in the middle of one or finishing one, we've already started the conversation. We're having a little mini meeting on the set about the next one. So, um, yeah, I like, I, like, I like being busy enough so that you don't, get, you don't get precious about things. You know, you sort of give yourself a certain amount of time and when it's done, it's done. The, great, the other great thing about the technology that we used on Unsane was two weeks ago, a little over two weeks ago, I had an idea and I wanted to, uh, to add something. And so all I had to do was go to the backpack and retrieve the phone and uh, go shoot it. So that was, that was easy. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thanks. thank you. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!